Hello, welcome to Furious Driving, and today I am at the wheel of what is currently the only electric estate car on the market in the UK. Yes, today I am driving the MG5 electric estate, the 5 EV. Now, I have long time said that SUVs are the wrong body style for an electric car, even though that is the predominant style that all the manufacturers, MG included, are pushing quite heavily because those are big sellers at the moment and the market is pushing more manufacturers to making more SUVs. However, when you build an electric car, you want the slipperiest shape through the air and you want a lower center of gravity so your big heavy battery isn't wobbling around in the sky and you're not pushing a barn through the air, which means SUVs aren't actually the right shape for these things. And despite what the marketing people will tell you, an SUV isn't really the best shape for a family car either. An estate car is, which is what we're in right now. Now the MG5 is terrific value for money and this is possibly why a lot of people will be drawn to it in the first place. Partly maybe they'll be thinking it's the old British brand of MG, others will be thinking it's an incredible value. This is the most miles per pound of any electric vehicle on the market according to the maker. And it is great value. The entry level Excite with the lower range battery comes in at only £25,000 which is astonishingly good value. It's a lot of money certainly if you're in the used car market and you're looking at less than 10 grand that does sound like a lot of money still but for a brand new electric car that is quite impressive and more to the point arriving very soon and for not many more thousand pounds there is a long range version with around 250 miles in the battery which puts into the territory of far more expensive electric cars so let's pull up take a look around the exterior and interior and then go for a bit more of a drive so stepping out of the five SWEV, we do have a fairly standard looking estate car. It's attractive in an understated kind of way. They've done a few embellishments with bits of chrome around the grill, multi-slat thing going on, various chrome highlights around the air intakes down here, similar things on the rear of the car. The headlights are quite interesting with this big Y-shape flowing, very Marvel Universe <laughs> effect of the light clusters here at the front. And this long swage line which creases out and flows down the length of the car, rising like a wave at the back. And also there's an interesting, hard to see in the black car actually, double crest of a crease down here. A mini swage and a larger swage going rippling along the length of the car. Adds rigidity, adds visual interest. In a way, it does feel a bit like they've thrown all the visual toys and treats over at the SUVs like the uh, ZS to try and make them look a bit more blingy and fun. You don't get the same two-tone diamond car wheels as you do on the ZS, but this is, I do think, a more handsome car underneath without the embellishments. It's also a more slippery shape, so more suited to the electric drivetrain. This lower front profile, lower roof line, and more ground-hugging shape helps it achieve a 3.6 kilowatt per hour uh, fuel efficiency rating, which is better than the, um, the four-wheel drive shaped things. On the outside there are only five colours available, white, black, silver, red, and I think a blue as well. So not the huge range of colours we used to get in the old days, which is a shame. It'd be nice to see this in like a metallic green or something, that would really make it sparkle. Now these are only 16 inch wheels, which feels quite small in the rest of today's market, where 17 seem to be the smallest size available on a lot of cars. Um, and also it seems to ride quite high. Interestingly, the long range car actually rides 9mm higher for some reason. So even more on stilts. This does look like it would be quite attractive if you dropped it about that much and put some bigger wheels on it. That would be quite an exciting sporty looking car then. Here at the front we have got the charge point hidden behind a door in here. You've got the two, car, two plugs, so you've got the standard size and the fast charging. 50 kilowatts on the short range, 100 kilowatt fast charging on the high power car. Now, I know some people prefer a side or a rear mounted charge point but I actually find this is the most convenient place to put it because it doesn't matter which side of the car you pull up on with the uh, charge point beside the car it's always here at the front it doesn't matter if you've got the wrong side you diagonally can't reach also it means if you're going shopping somewhere the front of the car is at the charge point the back of the car is free and able to load stuff in so it's my to my mind this seems to be the most logical place to put it now here's a tailgate. We, interestingly, we have the MG logo curved over the, uh, the bend of the boot. I've never seen the MG logo bent that way before. And the interesting tail lights with a nice big slash of chrome sort of cutting through the center. A little bit like a Jaguar XF almost, you might say. 
down here we have got all the badges, the many letters that make up the car's name. It does look a little bit pressed in. I think if I was redesigning this layout, I would maybe put the MG down here and the SWEV on this flatter panel here. It's just crying out for the labels to be put on it. But then I'm not designing the car, so what do I know? Okay, big button underneath there and the reversing camera hidden on the back of that. The boot is big, 578 litres with the seats up, 1476 with the seats down. That's a lot of load space to be cramming in here. Unlike the ZS SUV, it goes back a long way, so you can actually put large items, big suitcases, that kind of thing, will fit in here with relative ease. You've got a big cubby storage area here on the left, you've got a netted storage area on the right. Under the floor, we don't have a spare wheel, but we do have an inflation kit. What we don't have is an area specifically set aside for the charging cable if you need to carry it. You'd have to, I don't know, inventively wrap it around this polystyrene thing or try and shove it in this little side pocket here somehow. It doesn't quite fit though. You do have a soft load space cover which goes across it. It doesn't self-remove like it does on more expensive estate cars. Uh, you have a LED light here in the corner. No power socket I notice and one big criticism of the boot area because an estate car is ultimately a practical load lugger, a big useful family car, you would expect this lip to be down at the same height as the floor. This floor is not dual height or anything clever like that, it's just sitting down here. If you've got big heavy stuff to load in here, it's not going to go. Also, if you want to make use of the entire height of this boot space with one big item, like shifting a washing machine is the old, old go-to, again, you're not going to get it through the space. You just have too much of a, a cut into the aperture with this slightly curved boot space. So this is the only estate car electrically driven on the market and it's not the easiest estate to use. So. It's kind of 90% there, but then this does make it slightly not quite so useful. So that is a bit of a shame considering this is the only electric estate car on the market. So let's climb in and have a look around the interior. First of all, before I climb in, take a look at these seats. They are quite elegantly sculpted. I don't think it's real leather. It's more like a vinyl pleathery stuff, but it's, but it's very soft quite nice to touch and the door card also gets more of this soft touch uh, pleather here all around the armrest underneath it a little bit as well so it does feel nice when you rest your arm up there and nice bit of white contrast stitching as well it gives the whole lot a bit more visual interest also giving visual interest these swooping lines which slightly echo the pattern over on the uh, on the drivers and passenger seats as well but this is hard plastic and this is hard plastic and this is well, softer touch plastic up here. But you do get a nice shiny door handle surrounded by a bit of uh, aluminium effect stuff and a nice blue LED glow in the middle of the door lock switch. Again, more contrast stitching going on. And down in the door, as well as a large speaker area, we do have a great big uh, cubby hole area with a bottle standing bit in the front of it. Over into the dashboard itself, as we fire up, we do get the MG logo followed by the infotainment screen over here. And with the car woken up properly, we have our instrument binnacle wake up with the speedometer going up to 150 miles an hour on the left hand side. Over on the right hand side we do have the econometer thing. This takes the old BMW swingometer of efficiency to a whole new level. Uh, you'll notice at zero nothing is happening. Uh, going up the scale to 20, 40, 60, that's using more power, more boost. The car is working harder and using more of your battery and putting more um, energy into the motor. Swinging down into the blue area at the bottom, the charge area, when you lift off the accelerator, go into the curves mode, hit the brakes, then you go into the charge mode. The car is actually producing its own electricity. Now in the center of the area, we do have a multifunctional screen. The speed in the center, battery percentage on the left and battery voltage on the right and below lots of other useful information what gear we're in uh, what mode we're in in terms of um, sport normal or eco and also what level of curves if you notice that little number down there always defaults to number two when you turn the car on for some reason also you can have lots of other interesting bits and pieces on there your current journeys averages your lifetimes averages um, various electrical bits of information, including motor speed, which is quite an unusual thing to know. Tire pressure monitor, and also the good old favorite of electric cars, what is going where in terms of power, from the battery to the battery, always quite fun to watch. So I crack the door, because it's very warm in here. Now down to the right, we've got our start-stop button, headlamp levelers and mirrors, all tucked away by your 
right knee. Hiding behind the steering wheel, we have got our wipers on the right, our lights and indicators on the left, and completely hidden, unless you twist the wheel, is the cruise control. The car has got adaptive cruise on it. It's standard across the range. And the wheel itself is rather a nice sculpted, flat-bottomed leather item with uh, lots and lots of buttons all over it for infotainment for the various computery functions on the thing. It's adjustable for rake and distance, so lots of making it nice ability. Now moving back up to the top of the dashboard to keep things interesting and exciting, we've got uh, kind of pretend aluminium-y surrounds all around the air vents here on the right hand side. And into the center of the dashboard, rather than the fake aluminium which is here in the center of the grills, we've got a, well it's not even carbon fiber, it's like tiny monochromatic bricks. It's uh, like you're looking at a very, very early computer screen trying to show some, I don't know, advanced huge graphic on the side of a wall. It's quite interestingly sculpted as well, so we've got lots of shapes and things giving a bit of visual interest all over the place. Above it we've got slightly hard-wearing plastic, it's not the nicest stuff to touch, but then you're not going to be touching it very often. It is a really useful big tea shelf area, so you can put teas, coffees, sandwiches and cakes up here, no bother at all, it doesn't matter if you spill any, it's wiped clean. Down below that though we have got a nice tactile bit more clever down here with the uh, contrast stitching, so it does look and feel rather pleasant. Below that reasonably good sized glove box and in the middle the the show you came for bling we have the big infotainment screen so pushing the shiny button here in the center of the volume control will always take you back here to the home screen left hand side tap that that's a button that will give you your radio you could choose DAB FM AM or of course one of the other inputs from Bluetooth or your phone what we have here on the right hand side, Android Auto and CarPlay. Navigation works well, but now address input can be a little bit uh, irritatingly slow because there's a bit of a lag between each letter and number that you push on the screen, so that can get a bit wearing. You do have Android Auto and CarPlay. CarPlay lights up, then you can have seamless integration with your phone. You can use Nav from your phone, it'll read text messages to you, all that kind of good stuff. Listen to your Audible books, so yeah. You know, we've got a lot, of, a lot of good stuff. I could definitely recommend Last Smile in Sunder City or Neil Gaiman. Anyway, right. Here we've got a couple of other buttons below that, including your heated seats. And then down here, we've got our USB sockets. One is straight power, one is your Android or iPhone connection, and the other one is a straight old-fashioned 12 volt, not a lighter, just a 12 volt socket. Now, interestingly, this area does have a smooth riding cover over it to make it all look neat and integrated. It's piano black like the rest of this area here, but with that closed, you can't actually plug your phone in unless you can go and find yourself some very flat topped uh, USB lead that'll fit inside there. Well, I haven't got one of those, so I have to leave that open and, and visual, which is a bit of a shame. On the ZS, they've hidden the USBs on a deck below, which is, is quite nice. Moving back from that, we have got our heating and ventilation controls. It's only single zone, not dual zone. I can heat on the left, volume of air on the right hand side, air conditioning on off in the center. You may want to turn the air con off a lot if you're going on a long journey just to save a bit of juice. Moving back from that, this is all the same as in the rest of the MG electric range. The mode button for normal sport and eco, curves, which is power regeneration from braking and slowing. And this one just gives you a quick look at what the battery level is on the big middle of the big screen. Then we've got our gear selector, which again is a bit like the Jaguar XF. It's a big, nice mode dial thing. Push and turn to go to reverse or to drive. Hit the big mud in the middle for park. And it glows orange to show where you are. Now moving backwards, we've got what I think is a slot for your phone. It's all I can figure that one out to be. Auto park brake, which is there. And then twin cup holders. The front one is bigger than the little one. It's a trick they've learned from Sayat from about five years ago, which was terrible when Sayat did it. It's not a lot of use now either. And behind that, nice softly padded, pleather topped cubby hole, which is big enough for many items to go and lurk in there. One final useful thing we have in here in the front of the car, both sides of the transmission tunnel, we do have a little slotty area for putting, I guess it would be a phone in there as well. So driver and passenger can lose their phone down there whilst it's plugged into power. And it's not in somewhere that was distracting to the driver. You can't see the screen when it's down there. So it's actually quite a good idea. So your phone is safe, it's on charge, it's not gonna fall out, go under your feet. That's quite clever, really. Oh, final thing, the horn test. We didn't do a horn test. 
Yeah, that's a powerful modern horn for a modern day in a modern car. Yeah, I think we can be happy with that. Now climbing into the back, let's just bear in mind we have got keyless entry if you want it. I'm not a fan, I've had a car broken into with keyless entry before using a code grabby thing, I wasn't impressed. We have a very similar setup to the front with the swoopy, curvy, hard plastic, lots of soft touch pleather here, electric windows obviously, white contrast stitching, so all much of the same in the back as in the front. But what is very impressive in here, apart from the easy access to this great big door opening. This is a brilliant family car. People say they're like SUVs because you can climb in easily. Look at the size of this door aperture. You can just fall sideways through that. This would be a really good taxi actually. And I guess thanks to the uh, battery pack being under the floor, I'm assuming it is, I've not actually checked, we have quite a high floor in the back actually. Your feet do feel like they're above the floor and the floor line that they were in the front. It gently slopes up under the chairs uh, but you do have a completely flat area so if you are sitting three across in the back you've got a completely flat floor which is kind of nice like in a old Range Rover. You have twin USB power outlets in the back so two people can be charging their phones, charging their iPads, and Nintendos, what have you. You've got stretchy mat pockets in both seats and you've got, and you've got big door cubby hole things on both sides as well so you can drop a bottle of coke or water or whatever you want to drink in there. Big armrest which does have cup holders in there so rear seat t shelfery just there excellent and that's nice and soft for the elbow too and we have three proper full harness three-point belts in the back and three headrests as well headroom is well more than adequate it's uh, exemplary i might even go as far as to say this is actually a really good family car it's it's a nice comfortable back seat the only thing is because of the h point of the rear seats my knees are sitting quite high up above the uh the squab so my legs can't actually make contact with the, the front of the seat bench for a child though that's not going to be a problem if you've got three so under under 12s in the back of the car they've got a ton of space as you can see i have had a 10 year old in the back of here with his feet on the back of this chair sorry mg now looking under the bonnet of the car there is quite literally nothing to see here folks um, you know i complained for many years about how new um, petrol and diesel engines weren't exciting to look at because there's lots of fake plastic stuff over the engine right here this is literally nothing you can see a glimpse of orange power cable you've got your windscreen washer top up and another top up over there this is wow a surprise actually i didn't know what i was expecting to see i was expecting to see something that wasn't a huge sheet of black plastic so yeah oh well Unlike the Tesla, you do not have a front storage trunk in this car. So this car uses MG's rotary gear selector, so push and turn for drive, and also the other direction for reverse, and the thing just drifts away. It's electric, of course, so we have no clutch and manual gearbox as an option at all. This is the standard way of things. In the center of the car, we have got these three toggle switches. The mode button on the left is for eco, normal, and sport, and the car does really surge forward when you drop it into sport it becomes far more responsive but i tend to drive it in eco quite a lot to eke out a bit more range and next to that is your curves button your regeneration so as you slow down lift off the accelerator it starts using the motors to regenerate power and feed back into the battery you can actually set it up as a, one of the many many screens seeing what the car is up to which direction the power is flowing it's quite fun taking your eyes off the road momentarily to watch the power flow back into the battery and go green. There are three stages of this. The lightest one doesn't really do a lot. The highest one is almost one foot driving. Not quite as aggressive as things like the Nissan Leaf, but it's not far off. However, one bugbear of mine with this car is every time you turn it off, it resets to normal driving mode and the middle level of curves. And I often want it driving in eco and full um, curves to get the most range out of the thing. So uh, that is my only real gripe with the car, if you like. So we have put up behind a tractor and a queue of traffic so i'm not getting the most dynamic experience at the moment i can though look at the guy opening the lock for his boat that's quite nice oh it's a train now brilliant now the thing that really strikes you as soon as you get in this car is just how soft the ride is it feels like something from a couple of decades ago really well, you may have noticed how high the car sits as you walk up to it and that does reflect in the way it rides. It is astonishingly comfortable. If you go over a bump, a speed bump, 
the terrible roads we have around here, all these sunken manhole covers, you barely feel it. You just hear a thump thump from the tires as you smoothly cruise over them. That does of course mean that it's not the most excitingly dynamic car, but it is a very comfortable family cruiser though. Now recently I drove the MG ZS electric car and I felt the steering on that was really numb and lifeless. Now, although this does lack really very much feel, it is an awful lot better. Now performance is a bit of a strong point for this. 0 to 60 is 7.7 .7 seconds, which puts it in a fairly rapid bracket. We're now doing well, 65 miles an hour and the wind noise well, there virtually isn't any. There's hardly any tyre rumble. As I always say, estate cars are the best family haulers. They are the best all-rounder, really, because you've got all the space and all the pace. Now, recently we drove the MG ZS EV, which is you know, similar in many respects to this car in terms of the kit and the price. However, I did feel the ZS's steering was really quite numb and lifeless. This isn't brilliant in terms of feedback, but you do get a bit more from it than you do from the ZS, even though you don't really feel any difference in the weight from the lowest parking speed all the way up to motorway speeds. It's still just uniformly quite light. It is very accurate, obviously. There's no play, no wobble, no drift. It goes where you point it. It's just you don't really feel much coming back from the tyres. And uh, as you head into the twistier B roads, it doesn't wait up, giving you that little bit more feedback you might want. Visibility out the windows is extremely good. The uh, A posts slant back very, very sharply, but they're not too big and chunky, so you don't have a big blind spot just there, and the mirrors aren't too massive either. And the B posts, even where I'm sitting fairly well back, are just in the right place to not give me a problem looking out. Only once or twice on the motorway have I found something lurking on my rear corner that I couldn't spot in the mirrors. Now range anxiety is less of a problem in this car. Even less of a problem will be when it hits the long range version in a few weeks time. Whereas with cars with a well a definite sub 200 mile range, anything beyond a local journey will be giving you proper range anxiety. This thing with its a real world 200 plus miles in the tank, it does mean you can actually go places and not really worry too much about well, you're going to get back or not, or are you going to have to struggle to find a charger? You can really get quite a long way, and certainly the longer range version, which is the version I would absolutely go for, will be a big improvement on that again. The seats are another strong point of this car. They're extremely comfortable. The, uh, the vinyl let pretend pleather is well, hard, looks hard wearing and it's uh, very soft to the touch. They're nicely padded and they're quite supportive, so you do have good lumber in the lower back, good side bolster support, and they just, yeah, they just feel nice really. And there's lots of adjustability. It's multi-way electric on the driver's seat, only manual on the passenger. Now there's only two trim levels on this thing, Excite and Exclusive, but then that's broken into two sub trim levels of the standard and the long range cars. The most basic entry level Excite is gonna set you back about 25,000 pounds to 25 and 95 after you've had your two and a half thousand pound electric vehicle rebate. And the most expensive one, the Exclusive Long Range, isn't particularly much more expensive. It's 31 grand before the rebate, just under 29,000 once you've had your rebate back on it. Uh, even the most basic cars are very well equipped. They all get Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. They all get the MG Pilot package, which includes auto lights, auto wipers, uh, traffic jam assist, auto brake assist, adaptive cruise. There's lots of stuff that's included as standard. Move up to the higher level and you get things like the reversing camera included. Now, regardless of trim level or battery power, you only get one choice of powertrain. With the standard range car, you have a 52.5 kilowatt hour battery. If you go to the long range car, that jumps up to a 61.1 kilowatt hour battery. All of them though use the same 156 horsepower equivalent motor in the front of the car driving the front wheels only. Well, thanks for watching today. I hope you've enjoyed and found informative this drive around in the MG5 EV Estate. Probably uh, at the time of recording, the only electric estate on the market in the UK and kind of by default, the car that I would have to choose if I was buying an electric car tomorrow. If you've enjoyed this, please do hit like and subscribe as always, and leave a comment below if you found this useful. And join me again next time driving something completely different.